Thank you for inviting me in my hometown. Uh, it's a pleasure to have a keynote in my hometown. Normally I have to go abroad somewhere. I slept in my own bed this night, so I'm ready to go for it. The story is about the talent detection system, and we will move forward to selections. And uh, I have some... Okay, I have some topics. Uh, first of all, I would like to know what coaches need in their sport to talk about basketball, of course. Then, what do children like to play? Next question, how do children develop? What is talent detection? Do we have to sample or specialize very early? Talent orientation, is that possible? Talent identification in basketball topic, but I will give some information in gymnastics, something completely different. Maturity, under 14, very important for you. Position specific orientation in basketball, later on. And then, of course, the talent selection that you will have as uh, the last topic. So, let's start with this. You coaches in basketball, you look at the playground in school and I ask you to take 10 of these guys to train them the next five years. But I ask the same question to the swim coaches and the gymnastic coaches and the volleyball coaches. And what do we see? That when you choose 10 children, probably the swimming coach and the gymnastic coach and the basketball coach will take the same 10 children because they move good, and so you detect the best movers. You didn't identify basketball players or swimmers. That's the next step. So first thing is, who are the best movers? And is it possible with these best movers to work a bit further? So can you try to fulfill their dreams? My dream, 12 Olympians ago, was to become a basketball. Now, if you see all those tall guys here, that was not really a very good decision for me to become a basketball player. So I became a gymnast. That was the reality nine Olympians ago. I had other qualities. And which qualities do you need? That's our first question. The coaches know what you need in basketball. And so we did a survey with these coaches. And an example is that we looked at um, what you need in racket sports. So what are the differences between table tennis, between badminton and tennis? And we ask the coaches to fill in the same survey. And this survey, uh, we did it also with basketball coaches, volleyball coaches and so on. So at this moment, we have approximately 1,100 uh, surveys and we do some statistical analysis, uh, artificial neural networks to find out which are the differences between all those sports. And the results in the racket sports, for example, is that you see a lot of similarities and a lot of differences between these sports. So things are the same and things are different. And in the invasion sports, you see that basketball, volleyball and soccer also, you can divide this based on the characteristics in those sports. Okay, I will explain this a little <coughs> bit more into detail later on. But with the discriminant analysis, it was possible to allocate 98% in the correct group. And if you validate it by taking one out to leave one out, you have 91%. <coughs> These are the qualities that we looked for. And you see the green things are the similarities and the differences are in red. Okay. Details later. What do children like to play? That's probably <coughs> most important at the age of 8, 9, 10, before they start with their sports. And therefore, we developed an app, which is called the Sports Compass I Like. And it's a journey through the universe of sports. So we take children into a journey. You have Sporty, he guides you. He asks you if you like to run. He asks you if you like to play with the ball. He likes to play indoor or outdoor. And then, which suit fits for you? It's easy to ask children, do
do you need a tall uh, uh, suit or a big one? Uh, and they, they can choose one uh, based on what they see in their class. So I am tall, probably I will take this one here. Yeah? And then, if you answer all these questions, you can launch the rocket and you come into a space with all your sports. That's the main thing of the app that we developed and this is how it uh, works. Vaak heb je dat kinderen heel veel onderdelen binnen een gymles heel goed kunnen. En doordat ze zoveel dingen kunnen, weten ze ook niet precies wat ze willen doen. En aan de hand van de iLike app komen er een aantal hele uh, duidelijke sporten naar voren. En daardoor kunnen we ze heel vroeg doorsturen naar een vereniging toe. Waardoor het talent eigenlijk niet verloren gaat. Mijn rol is als uh, sportdocent om uh, leerlingen te monitoren. Dat doe ik twee keer per jaar. En met de iLike app uh, kan ik heel goed een richting geven aan leerlingen die nog geen sport hebben. Uh, dat doen we samen. Ik ga met een kind zitten en dan vullen we samen de I Like App in. En daarin komt het heel erg gericht uit uh, welke sport ze mogelijk kunnen doen en die uh, ja, echt bij hun aansluit. De I Like App geeft een aantal vaardigheden zoals samenwerken, zoals sprinten, uh, waarop kinderen aan kunnen geven of ze het leuk vinden of niet. Uh, en wat wij zien is dat de sporten die uiteindelijk uit het resultaat komen, uh, ook enthousiasme wekken bij de kinderen. En dat vinden wij vooral heel belangrijk. Dat wij nog beter kunnen legitimeren uh, waarom we het advies geven wat we doen. We vinden het bij de gemeente Nijmegen belangrijk dat de kinderen in een kansrijke uh, omgeving opgroeien. Daar hoort een uh, vereniging, een sportclub ook bij. Uh, dankzij de Hogeschool Arnhem Nijmegen en de I Like App die zij ontwikkeld hebben, kunnen wij kinderen die nog niet lid zijn, maar wel behoefte hebben om te sporten in hun vrije tijd gericht en goed adviseren. En daar zijn we ontzettend blij mee. Op het moment dat je weet waar de kinderen goed in worden, dan kan je daar eigenlijk die ontwikkeling mee gaan naar sturen. Dat betekent niet dat je één richting uitgaat, maar dat je dus eigenlijk zo breed mogelijk motorische ontwikkeling gaat stimuleren van die kinderen. In de sport is er heel veel traditie met het meten van vaardigheden. Maar er is nooit eigenlijk rekening gehouden met de sportvoorkeuren van de kinderen. Waarom doe je dat graag en wat doe je graag? Hoe meer kinderen dat je aan het bewegen krijgt en aan het bewegen houdt, omdat ze in de juiste sport zitten en er weinig uitvallen, hoe liever dat we het hebben. Dus op dit moment zien we dat er heel veel drop-out is. En dat komt voornamelijk omdat kinderen op een zeker ogenblik beseffen dat ze eigenlijk ofwel niet goed genoeg zijn. Dat is jammer. Maar anderzijds het niet graag doen en dat is al helemaal jammer, want daar hebben ze dus de verkeerde keuze gemaakt, bij het begin waarschijnlijk. En daar willen we toch iets aan verhelpen. Vakleerkrachten hebben heel erg de behoefte aan handvaten om sporttalent te herkennen. Dat niet alleen op subjectieve mate te doen, maar ook heel erg met tools. Tot nu toe zijn het heel erg positieve reacties op de I like app. De kinderen vinden het heel erg leuk en de vakdocenten zien echt dat ze daar iets mee kunnen. Het voordeel is voornamelijk het plezier wordt daarin gemeten. En bij veel sportkeuzetesten gaat het om motorisch en fysiek. En dat is op jonge leeftijd nog helemaal niet zo relevant. Het gaat er veel meer om wat vindt een kind leuk. En om door dat te vertellen hopen we ook dat we ze stimuleren om het vaker en meer te gebruiken. Okay, so one of the tools is the I Like app. Next thing, uh, how do children develop? And therefore, uh, we see that normally coaches work with an average group. And you see that this average group has a, some evolution. For example, a standing long jump, when you're 12, you jump one meter and 70 centimeters. And then the year after, you jump 10 centimeters further. And the same for speed and so on. But more important is what happens with the high potentials. They go faster in their development. And another thing is that the low potentials 
even go backward and they don't jump 170 this year, but 160. So that happens in schools and that's something where we have to be aware of and the same uh, is important in the clubs, of course. So we developed some programs and this is an example of a program for school, but we can do it in the clubs as well. This is very easy for badminton. You, everybody can do this. This is a bit more uh, difficult for the average performance because you need already to be aware of your uh, teammate. And this one is the most difficult for those children. They have to alternate red and white and you will see that they will bring this back to there because they know otherwise it doesn't work. So you have to look around you and it gives you more the idea of the game. So we try to develop this kind of programs to help children to develop the motor capacity, but you can do the same in the clubs at every age. And this is important because <coughs> the most important thing is here that you have enjoy what you do, the play, and it's easy and you can divide and differentiate between those children. Next thing is how will we detect talented children? How will we detect the better movers? And therefore, we have a test battery, and the test battery is more towards the motor competence than towards uh, the physical fitness. Because normally, you measure physical fitness. If you measure physical fitness, you measure what you see, the actual performance. And this is not what you want as a coach. As a coach, you would like to know how they will perform in 10 years. So this is more important than this kind of tests. You can do it with basketball players as well. One very good example is we did, we did the same test in basketball in Flanders, but also in volleyball in Flanders. And the girls that got the medal, the bronze medal at the Europeans, they were all the highest ranked with this kind of tests. So you can imagine that you have big feet and very high posture, so it's not uh, easy to do this. And compared to gymnasts, it will be worse. But the best performers in your group, with tall guys or tall girls, will have the most potential to work with. They will have less injuries. They will train much fa uh, faster. This is another test. And this one is the third test in this test battery, which helps you to detect the better movers. So if you can do this at the age of seven, you already know something and you know what is the potential and how they probably can evolve in the future. Oh, uh, and then uh, this one is a coordination test. And we put everything in <coughs> an online tool so we, we put all our data online in the tool and it is easy to uh, have the information, our data. So two things, physical characteristics, you measure them. It's necessary to know if they are fast, if they have uh, enough speed, if they jump good and so on. But it is the actual performance. More important is the potential of the performance. So, and this is measure, measured by this uh, kind of tests. The next thing is that, are we going to sample or specialize at a young age? And when are we going to change towards <coughs> the specific basketball? So in the beginning, uh, you start with a broad development. And we have a matrix where we see that if you have a 100% fit with your profile, and in this case for badminton, 100% fit, which means that rhythm is 6 out of 10, uh, swimming 0 out of 10, you don't need it, and so on. So if you fit in this profile, what about other sports? Well, table tennis and tennis are close to it, 93%. And then a bit further, with the Hits, hitting sports with baseball and hockey, you see that it's already a little bit more to the side. Uh, basketball and volleyball, 
and then in the end gymnastics and sailing has nothing to do with badminton but important in this is the development of your players you can look instead of looking to the sports in this way what do we need and what can we do in other sports and how can we motivate our badminton uh, basketball players uh, at a certain moment they always play basketball, basketball, ba basketball and they become bored of basketball. So why not playing something completely different to train the abilities in climbing, uh, for example? Is that necessary or not? Okay, we, we need it in basketball. No, we need, well, yeah, we need it. So a little bit. So you can do this kind of skills in other sports. So that helps you to give in during your uh, education of your players at 14 years, you keep them motivated and you do something completely different. What we saw in badminton is that the elbow and the shoulder is really injured at a certain moment. So why not playing something completely different so that you don't have this kind of injuries? So, if you have to choose it between specializing and sampling, this is what often happens in the schools. This is what happens in the clubs. We think that there are two other approaches. You can have a broader specialization. So try to keep something in mind and to use some other sports to broaden this specialization. And in the schools, the PE teacher can have a more directed sampling. Okay, next thing. How are we going to orient people towards the sport? And therefore, we had a very big program, uh, Sports Compass, where we tested a lot of children in Flanders. I, do, I didn't do that on my own. We had colleagues, 10 people that had PhDs on the Sports Compass, and we tested more than 20,000 children in the primary schools and more than 2,000 in the elite sports schools. So Oli knows that and Sven knows that, that we tested also in the basketball schools. And it was possible to make the profiles of every, uh, of every sport. And the Sports Compass is uh, a tool with three different modules. So the I like, you saw it already. The I do is the next, what I'm going to explain. And the I am has got to do with the motivation of the children. How are you motivated? What is your perceived competence? A questionnaire for the children to help them and to know as a coach what is their potential. So we do this in the schools. This is what we ask those children in the setting. Why do you play sports? What are you good at? And what do you like? And this is our I do. With 16 tests, it is possible to allocate those children two different sports. And this is the puzzle. And in basketball, for example, four of those parts of the puzzle are very important and it discriminates already for 80%. If you do all the tests, it's possible to discriminate for 91%. So we did this with the top sports schools. This test, everybody did the same test. And in the end, it was possible to put 97% into the correct sport. That means that if you have nine sports here, in every corner you will have people from the same sport. Because we know that the basketball players and the volleyball players should be that way, and the gymnasts and the judo that way. Because they are small, they are tall. And then they play with the ball, and so you can divide them. And 97% is possible to orient them. So the puzzle fits. And this is the way that we made those benchmarks. It is, of course, obvious that basketball players are tall, gymnasts are small. And what about the others? But not only for stature, also for a five meter sprint. Who is the fastest in five meter sprint? That's a more difficult question. We know that. And we know that, for example, the badminton players are the fastest. Who is the most flexible? Of course, gymnastics will be at the top there. And this is the study uh, which was in the European Journal of Sports Science that I did with Verle, uh, she's on the list, and we worked together and we tried to make our benchmarks for the elite sports schools. So, for example, a boy 
measures 166, jumps three, uh, 33 centimeters with the counter movement jump. And what does that mean for your sport? Well, for fencing it means that he's a bit small and he's almost average. 100 is average. What does it mean for another sport, gymnastics? 166 is already tall and he jumps almost average. What does it mean for triathlon? He's got a lot of fast twitch fibers and he's almost average. So these kind of benchmarks, we can make them for bas uh, badminton and of course for basketball as well. And you see that this is not tall enough and he doesn't jump high enough. That's the way how we build it, our benchmarks and it ends into a profile of each child and we can orient them towards sports. So you see that Anna is more into gymnastics, Joseph is more into triathlon, swimming, athletics, and Lucas is more into the invasion sports, basketball, volleyball, soccer, the ball sports. Next topic is the talent identification. This becomes more important for you, of course, because this is where you are as a coach. At a certain <laughs> moment, you have to decide who am I going to select in my group and what is the chance that they will become champions? Okay, with the same generic test battery, you can continue. If you do this in all schools, in all the classes, uh, the generic test battery, and it started this year in Flanders. We have our sports compass and we may test all the children in Flanders, which means that we can test 70,000 children this year, next year, 2019, that are in the third class uh, in the primary schools. But if you have that as a benchmark in five or ten years, probably if we put some sports-specific tests for basketball here, and we keep out the low, uh, the low uh, relevant tests, then you have a new test battery which is more uh, towards basketball. This is the case for gymnastics. Those are sport-specific tests. In this case, we had 756 high-potential girls. During seven years, we had approximately 100 best gymnasts in Flanders. They were all there and they all thought that they would become the new world champion. So at the age of seven, they are there. The coach is next to them and the coach thinks the same. He thinks, okay, this will be the next champion. This is a really dangerous thing because what happened with those 756? Well, we saw that uh, the non-sport specific motor test battery was very important to detect them and to see their potential. And this is how we see the potential. This is a low potential, this is a high potential girl, seven years old. This is what the coaches decided. We're not going to take her into the group to select her and to do some uh, more exercises with her. This is what the scientists thought and this is what was the decision at that time. So. This was, of course, okay for the coaches, for the scientists, and the decision was, of course, we take the, her in the group of the elite sports school. Very special case, because everything is green, only three out of 756 had this kind of profile. Three. One red. Remember the red. Okay, now, what we saw with those girls, we made an survival analysis. And what is a survival analysis? You know, if you have cancer, you die. But if I give you the right medi medicine, you will survive. And so, in the survival analysis, we see that some medicines work better than the others. And you see that people drop out or die. But the same happens in sports. People drop out of gymnastics. People drop out of basketball. And what is the reason? Mostly, in literature, you find that the reason is motivation. I don't like it anymore. My coach is yelling at me all, all the time. Uh, all things with motivation. 
We did this study because we were aware of the characteristics that you need. And what you see is uh, three cohorts here that we followed up. And five years later, we lost 85% of the girls. Can you imagine? Seven-year-old, uh, 243 girls thinking that they will become the new world champion. Five years later, 35 left. They train 25 hours a week. So at the age of 12, you don't do gymnastics anymore. You, don't, you will never do any sport anymore because you're so bored of sport. So this is really a shame that, it can, that this can happen. So we have to be aware of that and we have to find solutions to do something with that. So the orientation is very important and also the training and the transfer of the, co of the sports is very important as well. So Verle also helped me with this study, of course. And this is how the medicine works. Some of those uh, characteristics you fall out earlier or later. So if you are seven years and you sprint faster than 3.9 on a 20 meter, you have 70% more chance to survive in five years. If you sprint 4.28, you will drop out for sure. This is something that we see that some characteristics are there and you can see it at the age of seven, they will survive or they will not survive. If they will not survive, you have to provide them something completely different. If I come in your club to play basketball, you have to say to me, Johan, no chance. Try something else or try at a lower level. You will never become a champion. So don't put my, your hand on my shoulder and say, you are going to be the next champion because that's not true. So you know it, you see it and it's possible to detect it very early. So the story is that this girl became European champion two times. And that's this profile with this. She's world class. She's really good. She was third at the world championships. And this red dot is the floor exercise. At the age of seven, coaches already saw that her floor exercise was not good enough. Well, it is still her weakest apparatus. It's still her weakest apparatus, but she's world class. So she, weak is very, uh, okay, it's not what you should say for her. So it is possible at the age of seven to find the high potentials. This is important to know. If you see such a green profile, you have to do something with them. You have to motivate them. You have to keep them in your group and you have to give them the correct development so that they are motivated, so that they stay into your sport as long as possible. So three out of 756 had such a profile. Where are the two others? Probably injured, probably bored. Something should have happened. So you can try to keep those three in the group if you have programs for injury prevention, if you have program, uh, programs for motivation and transfer of skills, transferable skills are important in every school and in every sport. So there you can win a lot in the future. So what's left? Basketball. How are we going to apply this in basketball? This is our generic test battery. We don't need this, we don't need that, and we can probably add some tests as sport specific. And that means that you can build a complete shim for basketball. This is what we did in the elite sports schools. And this is one of the girls. And these are the important pieces of the puzzle. And you see that the complete story is green. It's OK. This is a girl with a lot of potential. But there are some weak points. We have to work on some of these points. That girl plays in the national team, by the way. And this is the ranking of all those girls. And you see, the more you come 
to, uh, to the top it's green and they're more and more red and red and red. So this is what you should be working with and how you should have success in the future. So you can make these kind of profiles and I will show you another example in uh, the next topic. The next topic is a difficult one. It's a maturity and maturity under 14 that's the time that you have to be aware of their maturity because things happen in boys. In girls it's a bit earlier under 12, under 13 uh, and we have a nice study at the moment in Kuala Lumpur with the Badminton Federation. You know that badminton in Malaysia is the sport. That's the thing. And uh, we train people to do this kind of tests over there. And uh, they do the tests and I did the analysis at home. So last week I analyzed for Badminton Malaysia who is going to be the next into their elite sports school? This is crazy because uh, uh, a guy from Flanders may decide who is going to be their next champion. Okay, but they trust me, that's a good thing, but it's also a little bit stress on the shoulders. And this is how we applied it. Anthropometry, we had six 12-year-old uh, boys in the group last year. Uh, and they are in the elite sports school and now we have 27 12 year old boys that we are going to try to fit in the same profile so we tested the top sports school and this is our reference those six the 27 others how about their profile and how will we find the next champion so some generic things that we saw in the complete test battery and for physical performance, again, some generic, but some additional, more related to badminton in this case. And here, the coordination tests, of course. This is very important for us. And then we move on to profiles for everybody. This is a green profile. You know that probably this is somebody who can have success in the future. You will have to develop his talents, of course, but it gives you already a message of what is worth. This is more difficult to bring him to a top level. This is a guy in the group of 27 Malaysian 12-year-old badminton players, top 27 in Malaysia, Probably we find one here in Belgium, one here in France, but uh, 27 really good players, but not the world top. This is the profile what we're looking for. So they have to be aware of their strengths and their weaknesses. And then it's important to look at them. The motor quotient is here. And all those guys in the elite sports schools are ranked up and this guy is very close to it that's a good thing so that's probably one of the guys that we need in the next generation okay the six boys and that one now what does it mean for the five meter sprint if you rearrange your data He's already here, and some of the guys in the elite sports schools are not that fast as he is. So, he's got very <coughs> good sprint capacities. So, you can do that for every uh, single skill and look where he will end into the system. And then, most important is that we would like to know something about their growth prediction and about their maturity, because this is the topic maturity, and therefore we uh, use the Kamis Roach method, where you can have biobanding. I don't know if people know about the biobanding from Sean Kerming, but here you see that if you have a stature which is under 85% of your predicted adult stature, there is no problem, you are prepubertal. Behind the 95, you are post-pubertal. 
The difficult phase is this one, the growth spurt between 89 and 95. There you should develop things differently and try to be aware of injuries here in this, in this uh, band. And in our same system, we see those bands, 12-year-old boys, and you see that some of them are late mature and others are at the end of their growth spurt. So you can re-rank them, and that's important because this guy is late mature and his sprint's already good, and his motor caution is, is also good. So this is a guy that you should have in your group. This is important to take him into your group. So we advised the people in Malaysia to take him into the selection. The selection is made by the coach. The coach decides, I need these guys. But you know as a coach that it's difficult to select. And sometimes they're afraid of selecting. So they try to add scientific data and they talk together, what are we going to do with this? Sven knows the system because we did it some years ago, how to take people and keep people into the system. Okay, but now at this stage we're a bit further, Sven, uh, it's some years ago that we worked together. But this is the way you can uh, help your identification and your selections. Next thing is what about position specific skills and position specific things in basketball? Well, at the age of under 14, it's not necessary to work on position specific uh, orientation, but I will show you some, uh, some data and a paper that we wrote with Jan Bone and Jan Bourgeois. And they made a paper on the morphological and the physiological profiles on basketball players in Belgium, elite. They all played European uh, competitions. And you see that in the five positions in basketball, you have different stature, different weight, different fat percentage, and also their physiological characteristics and speed and agility and dynamic leg power, it all differs from position to position. So is it possible to predict somebody into a position? And we made a paper on that because we did some artificial neural networks some years ago to see if we could fit everybody into the correct position. And this is the tool that we made. So uh, somebody who is on position five, which is uh, a power forward, I guess. Is it correct? No. no. Center. Center is five. Power forward is four. So if the lights are green, they probably are in this, uh, in this position. And it depends all on the data here. You put in the data, and you see immediately this is this position for this guy at this age. And this is our statistical validation. You see that all the guys are close to each other in every of these positions. And it is already a 97% fit of putting all the guards in the same corner and all the power forwards in the same corner and so on and so on. Uh, if you apply the neural networks, it is even 100% correct model, everybody in the right position. So it is possible, but it is possible with the uh, elite athletes at the highest level. So probably we can translate this a little bit earlier, but I don't think it's important at the age under 14. The last thing is the talent selection. How are you going to select? Of course, if you know all this, what I said before, <coughs> it should help you to come from an orientation to a prediction model. And first thing is you have to minimize the talent loss. That's your first uh, aim. And therefore, you should know that instead of selecting, you know that you are deselecting, that you have to do something with the group that you deselect. 
So what happens in Malaysia now with those badminton players is they are going to take five out of 27 into their top sports school. But what happens with the 22 others who are high potentials, they are giving them a future program, which means that next year they will be tested again. They see those 22 in another program and they try to keep them in the system. And probably if one falls out, another can come in into the group. And you don't waste 22 players from the beginning because this is dangerous. If I start with five 12 year olds and next year I have four and next year three, in the end I don't have anybody to play in competition at the highest level. So we have to be aware of the selection and the selection policy. Next thing is, this can help you. Importance of motor tests, I think this is very important. Even if you have big, tall feet, it's possible. We saw it with the volleyball players. They found that I was crazy when I asked them to do this, but in the end, we proved that it is important to do this with those young guys. And the next thing is that you should use statistical models to predict your sporting elite. It's possible to predict it. You saw it in gymnastics. So what we see in literature until now, everybody talks about talent identification and talent development. But we forget this skipped phase, talent detection, the better movers. And another skipped phase is that uh, when you see it in different uh, sports, basketball is doing his own talent identification, his own deselection and his own development. Gymnastics, identification, selection, deselection, development, fencing, and so on and so on. All those sports do the same thing. So why not, in the beginning, putting this orientation tool as the missing link and put it behind the detection and orientation? So this is our thing for uh, our selection system. And the last and next step that I would like to tell you is, we talk about a, uh, a selection system, but I think it's more important to go forward to a development system and keep people into the group and keep people into the complete uh, story. I never knew what I was going to do because when I was young, uh, I, pl I played everything. And so I don't know where I'm good at. And that's why I do everything at the same time. I thank you for your attention.